why have I chosen this topic of jugular dysautonomia? Well, first I kind of have to explain what is the autonomic nervous system. And the best way to understand it is it's the part of your nervous system that you don't think about. It just happens. These things are reflex actions. It's, it's the, the junction between the subconscious and the conscious. So any activity that, that goes on during the, the course of your day that your body's going to do and you're not physically actively thinking about it, it's most likely an autonomic function. So that includes things that we've heard so nicely about um, uh, in terms of the temperature regulation and the ability to go snorkeling to be out in the sun. If you have this disorder, you can't do that. Your body has a thermostat that doesn't work. Part of it is the way the body cools itself is shunting blood back and forth to the extremities. Part of it is perspiration and the ability to, to cool. Um, but that is a autonomic function, and in patients who have this, it's a dysfunction. But it also includes things that we don't typically think about, and, and I can tell you that I didn't really recognize until very recently these types of symptoms which are present in, in patients that I see, and that's the cardiovascular aspect. Low blood pressure is very common with this. I only recently have come to that recognition. Uh, a common complication of the procedure, or I shouldn't say common complication, a complication that we deal with with the procedure um, is what's called an SVT, it's a tachycardia. And it occurs as soon as we inflate the balloon in the jugular vein. It's like instantaneous, you inflate that balloon and that's when the SVT will occur. That is autonomic. So things that I didn't recognize, I'm now coming to understand and I can look back and reflect and say, okay, that makes sense. But these, these functions, are things you don't think about. And for patients who have this, they're going wrong. They don't work. What is dysautonomia? Well, that is the term that describes when your autonomic nervous system is failing you. And it can be one symptom, okay? It can just be one individual symptom. Or it can be every one of them. And if it's every one of them, typically this is something that, that you see in children. They're born with this. They, they do not have the ability to regulate all these bodily functions. So this is something that we see in many different disorders. It is not something unique to MS. This is much bigger than that, okay? Um, it is something that primarily is, is governed by the vagus nerve, which is the nerve that communicates these signals. And in the brain itself, it's primarily a function of the hypothalamus. There is involvement in the brainstem, however, but those are the two big ones, the vagus nerve and the hypothalamus. The things that we recognized in our patients that were going wrong, uh, actually well over a year ago when we actually started to screen our patients for these symptoms, are things that may sound familiar to you. Fatigue, disturbed sleep, brain fog, bowel and bladder issues. Those are the things that we identified our patients having, number one, and number two, when we did the treatment, those are the things that very consistently respond. Those all, as it turns out, are autonomic. So I myself have seen quite a number of patients with this, and this is, this is the thing that you, you take home when you see these patients. They have autonomic symptoms, virtually all of them. I've only had a handful of patients who didn't have autonomic dysfunction symptoms, and those are the ones that I've kind of figured out, hey, I really shouldn't be treating them because they're not going to respond, or it's going to be very unlikely that they're going to respond. Because when you do this procedure, what you consistently see improve across the board no matter which center you go to, you see fatigue improve, you see sleep improve, you see brain fog improve, you see thermal regulation improve. Doesn't matter where you go, those are the things you'll see and hear over and over respond. Yes, we all have patients that we know of that didn't go in walking but left walking. We have patients that had no sensation in their feet or their hands when they, had, when they went for their initial evaluation. When they left, they had that sensation. That happens doesn't happen as often as I would like, that's for sure. But consistently, the autonomic nervous system symptoms respond. Well, what's interesting about that is that your neurologists know all about this. In fact, in particular, they are most comfortable, perhaps, and most um, accepting of autonomic dysfunction with Parkinson's. There is a subset of Parkinson's disease where autonomic symptoms predominate. Well, we actually don't treat just MS patients. We treat any neurodegenerative patient, any patient who has these 
and autonomic symptoms will treat. And so we have treated Parkinson's patients, and they, they also respond in a similar manner. Not necessarily having the, the movement disorders respond, but clearly having the autonomic symptoms respond. That is what we're actually affecting when we do this procedure. There's actually studies out there, published studies, where neurologists, as you can see this quote from one of them, recognize the autonomic component to MS. This is a real part of MS, and it's a recognized part of MS by the neurologists. So I said that this was my opinion, and it, it is my opinion, but there are some interesting things out there that are available even on the NIH website. That's in the US. Uh, I think it's very, fairly equivalent to what you have here in Canada, but this is the official body when it comes to, to health and medicine. And I'm taking these from their website. They recognize that, first of all, the autonomic system is involved with neurodegenerative disorders, and they, they list actually Parkinson's as one. They also note that there is no cure for dysautonomia. There is actually no treatment, per se, for dysautonomia. If you do have a treatment, it is supportive and symptomatic in nature. It's not directly treating the problem. Going back to my opinion, I think we do have a treatment. So I'm of the opinion that that is what this procedure does. We are treating autonomic dysfunction. We need to prove this, we need to study this, but this could be the treatment for autonomic dysfunction regardless of what disease it may be associated with. It's not just MS is what I'm saying. It's a unique disorder, nervous system disorder, mind you, but it is one that we may have a new treatment that we kind of stumbled upon, really. We thought that we were treating the venous problem that was unique to MS patients and, and perhaps that, that is true. I don't know that that's not true. But maybe this procedure does something far more. We're going to find out. People like you are going to make us find out. We're going to keep pushing. So again, how this relates to this procedure, what is going on? How is it the veins are connected? Well, we certainly know that there's a theory about the vascular theory of MS, we, we clearly, I've been one that says that this venous hypertension in, in the jugular and azygous veins has led to this disorder. And here I am saying that maybe that's not the case, even though I've been one of the biggest cheerleaders of it. Um, I'm not sure. But there's a couple things that at least go through my mind when I try and analyze what this is. So first of all, could it be that there's venous compression from, an, from a jugular vein that has under too much pressure. Is that possible? Sure. That is possible. The only thing that would go against that is that typically when we do a, an evaluation with imaging, such as an MRV, what we see is that the jugular is collapsed. So that doesn't quite add up to me that if the jugular vein is collapsed in the patients who are symptomatic, that venous distension would compress the vagus nerve. Um, the other possibility is that venous hypertension, going back to that theory, is impacting the hypothalamus. Well, that could be. We know that there is venous hypertension present in these patients. We've measured it. The pressure is elevated. Could that be causing some hypothalamic dysfunction, perhaps mediated through the CSF? Sure. That, that seems logical. We need to study that. But what if actually it was some intrinsic abnormality, some functional abnormality, something wrong with the vas vagus nerve itself. And when you do this procedure to balloon the vein, you're not really doing anything but squishing that vagus nerve, and the compression is somehow impacting it. Well, let's think about that. When we see our patients, the, the key thing we're doing, at least I, I think different than say other venous angioplasty, is we're using an extremely high pressure balloon, the highest available. And the anatomy is such that the vagus nerve travels alongside the jugular and it's ensheathed in this very sturdy structure, very dense fibrous tissue that's going to resist expansion. So if you inflate this high pressure balloon in this closed space, what's going to give? It's certainly not going to be the artery. The artery is a pretty tough structure. If anything is going to suffer the pressure, it's going to be the vagus nerve. Another 
data point that supports this is that we do see patients who don't respond to the ballooning treatment because they have compression in the upper jugular region in the stylus cervical uh, interval. That compression can be completely occlusive on the jugular vein. If those patients undergo decompression therapy, that space may open perhaps a millimeter. So if you have an eight millimeter vessel and you increase the gap with which it passes to one millimeter, you're not gonna cause a substantial change in the flow through it, yet those patients respond. Well, we know from other venous compression disorders that nerve compression occurs along with the vein, and a millimeter difference on a two millimeter vagus nerve actually would be significant. So there are things that really fit with this vagus nerve as being the culprit. Here's a uh, picture from an intravascular ultrasound, and I don't have a pointer, but there we go. So this structure here, this dark structure, this is the jugular. Here's the carotid right next door, and this is the vagus nerve. So you can see, it's easy to imagine, if you were to inflate this balloon inside the jugular vein, really distend it, it's obviously not distended here, and it's within this dense fibrous sheath, that vagus nerve is going to be compressed. So looking back on our experience over the last year in particular, which is roughly a little over a year ago, we recognized these symptoms as being very consistent from patient to patient. We actually started to collect this information and wouldn't actually bring a patient into the clinic unless they had these symptoms. So we've looked at this data. And, and again, th these are things that are self-reported. So this is not really hard science, but it's a start. This is a start. <coughs> And what we found, as I mentioned, were this, was this subset, fatigue, interrupted sleep, brain fog, headache upon awakening. That's, that's actually a really key one in my opinion. Issues related to the bowel or the bladder and cognitive impairment, otherwise known as brain fog. So those are the things we asked every prospective patient. And we took that information and we distributed it out and you see that these things are, are fairly common and you can pretty reliably say if you have three of these symptoms that you're a good candidate for this procedure. So that's sort of the threshold. And the interesting thing is if you take these same patients who have these symptoms, immediately following the procedure in a very short interval, within, within minutes to hours, basically once the sedation's worn off, you can see these changes. We do have patients traveling a great distance, so the actual perception of them may not be immediate because of the fact that travel is involved different time zones. So your energy level, your sleep may not respond immediately. We also use a lot of hydration, so urinary symptoms may not respond immediately But the, in terms of the perception. But they're there. The effect is immediate. It is autonomic. But these are the things that very consistently, in fact, over 95% of the time, this is what happens. You do this procedure on a patient that has these symptoms, and over 95% of the time, they will respond. So this really points, again, to that something's going on specific to the autonomic nervous system. What's also nice is that these are consistent. They're maintained. They're, they're instantaneous effects that are maintained. Now, there are patients who relapse, and that's the part that I'm sort of struggling with. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about the venous anatomy and how it seems to correlate with relapse. But that's the one part about the autonomic dysfunction that I just I can't get a handle on. Um, I've already talked about that. Well, the other point I will make is that when patients do respond, if you, if you go a good solid six months without a relapse, it doesn't look like you do. I mean, I've had patients now that I've treated over two years that are maintaining the benefit. That's a pretty long time. Thank you. Uh, this slide's a little off, apologize for that. Uh, this is a breakdown in terms of the venous anatomy that we have identified, and you can kind of classify at least the venous anatomy by intraluminal, extraluminal. So what I mean by that is, is there an abnormality within the vein itself, or is there something going on outside the vein that is causing this flow obstruction? And we actually, we actually see that most patients who have this, they do have an intraluminal, something inside the vein, causing the problem, and it's actually the valve. So it's, it's not truly a stenosis, it's not really a narrowing, it's, it's basically a baffle would be the best way to describe it. A valve is, is a structure that is a fold of tissue, and we're probably all most familiar with the 